Well, welcome back to uh, the Solidarity Conference. Our next speaker is somebody who hardly needs any introduction. So let me first start with something personal, saying how privileged I am to have such a distinguished computer scientist as a friend and obviously as a colleague. Uh, this is Georg Gottlob. He is somebody who can do everything. He can speak many languages, uh, sometimes in the same sentence, moving from German, his native German, to English, French, Italian. He is one of the best known computer scientists at this moment. He is, uh, well, I think uh, his specialty is in data sciences, but uh, he has done other things as well. Uh, he has a position in two different universities. His main post at this moment is at the Oxford University. And he also has a position in Vienna at the Technical University. He is also uh, the CEO of and founder of several different companies, not just one. But some of them uh, have been uh, bought off by, by big, uh, big uh, players, such as companies Lixto and Rapidity with the WR. Now, listing all his uh, awards would take us uh, yeah. Oh, well, I was trying to do that on this abstract yeah. page and I didn't succeed. But let me just say that he is a member of several different academies. He is a member of the Leopoldina, which is the German National Science Academy. He is a member of the Academia Europea. I uh, chose that one particularly because for me, Georg stands for the European ideal. He has uh, been very engaged, not only as scientists, but also as a human being. He's also a winner of the Wittgenstein Award in Austria and the Ada Lovelace Medal. Ada, uh, here, the Lovelace, uh, the, the inventor of programming. So uh, it is my pleasure to let uh, him give us his talk on knowledge processing and the future of artificial intelligence. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let me try to share the screen now. Uh, I just call, yeah, knowledge processing in the future of AI. Now let me go to full screen mode and probably I should some way. Yeah, take. it's full screen, Georg. Yeah, it's full screen, very good. So uh, this talk, as you see, knowledge processing in the future of AI, the future of AI, of course, as I imagine it, and as I think it, it has to be, and it will be, hopefully. And, uh, this is connected to a project that I currently have, uh, and which is a long-term project called Raison Data, which I called Raison Data, and you see the AI is of course in red here, and it's reasoning about data and reasoning it's connected to reasoning in AI. Um, let me start with a very short and very incomplete overview of, of, of how AI evolved. And actually, as you can see here, AI evolved in two different streams, in two different, there are two different and mostly competing approaches here. One is symbolic AI, that's this column here, and the other one is sub-symbolic AI. So what is symbolic AI? Symbolic AI is connected to logic, knowledge representation, which we abbreviate by KR, and reasoning. So this is rests on logic, on thousands of years of, 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 of uh, results in logic. And several of these names, just in Mirna's talk, I think three or four of these names have, have fallen. Um, Avicenna, I remember, uh, Frege, Gödel, um, and of course there are others, Hilbert, Hilbert who wants to uh, mechanize mathematics and Russell uh, and Whitehead who try to do it, Gödel who disproves that this is possible, but a lot is still possible as we have even seen in, the, in all these talks. So it's not Gödel's impossibility theorem doesn't mean everything is impossible, it's impossible to give certain things are impossible but not everything. And um, the birth year of AI is 1956, which corresponds with my own birth year, by the way, um, where John McCarthy postulates that there should be knowledge representation, AI. So he, he starts to say, what, what is AI? What should AI be? Artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? How should it work? And among many other, several other things, he says, there should be knowledge representation and knowledge representation should be done via logic. And at the same time, uh, there's another logic approach, so not at all contradictory. Uh, Neural, Simon and Shaw uh, start with the first uh, theorem proving project called Theorist, which is rather successful, let's say. I mean, nowadays, of course, we have made a lot of uh, progress. And then there comes another area 
which I consider to be very uh, important because that's the application of, of all these ideas to real life project, uh, problems. And that's expert systems, for instance, Ed Feigenbaum, yeah, and his Dendrel is an expert system in chemistry and mycin in medicine. And there's also an approach by Doug Leonard, uh, which uh, still exists, uh, it starts uh, uh, first a project and then a company came out of it uh, where all the common sense knowledge should be formalized and that still exists and it still, I think it's, it's still very important, this project. Um, there, have been, there have been several other projects and that's a Sykes project. And um, Currently, expressive and efficient logics to work with big data are being uh, studied. Uh, one important thing is ontological reasoning. Ontological reasoning means reasoning about uh, how things are made, what constraints things are. Um, so ontologically is, it has a very specific meaning in here in this particular in, in, in AI. It means what is the relationship between uh, things? Uh, of course, categories, things, relationship, but categories not in the categorical, category theoretic things, but simply uh, classes of objects. Um, and specific logics uh, arose, description logics, and also variants of a language called data log that I will come back to. Another important thing is probabilistic reasoning. Uh, we need to reason, we need to generally, uh, statements are probabilistic and are not uh, crisp, and so we need to deal with them. And of course, there's a big problem here of, uh, of complexity that I will address. On the other hand, and pretty much separated from this stream here, we have sub-symbolic AI. Sub-symbolic AI is um, generally trying to simulate neural networks. It's like neural networks in the brain. So they have models that are of course slightly simpler than what, what happens in the brain, but these networks can uh, be trained to recognize things and to, to work. And the first model of neural networks, the first electronic circuit, uh, to my knowledge, uh, modeling neural networks was done by um, McCulloch and Pitts in 1943, that was not yet AI, but the starting theory of learning, machine learning basically was, in my opinion, again, I mean, I can, maybe I'm missing something here, but uh, 1958, Marvin Minsky, and he has actually already formulated a theory of how neural networks can learn uh, by how, and how they can be trained. So a network recognizes something, uh, has some inputs, and then it goes from some neuron and then you say yes or no and you can train it and you can say this is a good example this is a bad example and uh, the network can also in a certain sense try to marvin minsky has postulated that interact with uh, with a model of of, of uh, and, and do some explorations and and based on this exploration so this is called reinforcement learning which has been evolved much later into some concrete um, very good algorithms actually um then another very important point is 1986 by Ramenhardt, Hinton and Williams, backpropagation. Backpropagation, I will not go into detail, is a technique that uses differentiation uh, in a very sophisticated and very not nice way uh, to speed up the learning process of a neural network. And this made neural network learning very, very efficient. And with modern hardware, it became even more sufficient. And it's becoming now a great success. It's now a great success. Uh, neural network-based machine learning is a great success. There are new architectures currently, applications in game playing. AlphaGo is a very famous program by Google that um, uh, was can, could beat uh, the best Go player, Go champion. Pattern recognition is done uh, automatic. Uh, recogni pattern recognition is especially important for autonomous, mostly ve autonomous vehicles, uh, cars, and uh, of course there are also some shortcomings. Now I wanted to say, AI. There were big promises at the beginning in both bo both of these columns, and then there was a period called AI winter. Uh, from 1985 to 1992 approximately and where people said well too many promises not enough results and funding went down and then funding went up again and currently since 2012 there's an incredible hype now in machine learning and uh, it goes so far that people now say machine learning people who don't know who are not uh, computer scientists and not AI uh, researchers, they think machine learning is equal to AI. So AI is just machine learning and that's not true. So you have, they are forgetting all this, this column. And um, of course now there are even, there are lots of successes. Machine learning is, is, is very, very uh, good. And 
the hype is mostly justified in my opinion. Uh, of course, there are also greater expectations now and great successes and lots of dollars putting in, maybe again, too much hype in, in a certain sense because um, uh, it's not clear if machine learning alone can do it. But let's see, what, can it, what does, uh, what does uh, machine learning do really, really well? It does really well pattern recognition and classification. For instance, it does well image recognition. And this is something that also babies and animals can do very, very well. For instance, a baby face recognition, a baby can very quickly recognize its mother and there's nothing, I mean, it's fantastic that this is possible. Yeah, Nobody tells the baby how the mother looks like. Nobody tells the baby your mother has brown hair and doesn't wear glasses, etc. The baby wouldn't understand this. And still the baby recognizes this mother uh, his mother, its mother, just because it gets positive and negative rewards, positive rewards from the mother, the baby gets milk, uh, a need is satisfied by the mother, and, and, and at the same time the picture appears. Uh, so this is the way of association, and this is kind, this is very similar to machine learning. Negative rewards for other people, when other people come, they don't give the baby milk and they don't give too much attention to the, um, enough attention to the baby, etc. Here you can see in the next example that you can also learn uh, from negative rewards, learning to avoid touching nettles, for instance. Yeah, if a boy touches a nettle, it will, it will do it once or twice maybe, but then only maybe to experiment in a, in a, in a safe way, but not, uh, he, he will avoid nettles and just because of the negative reward that, that, that he gets uh, the pun uh, by doing it. So, and that's exactly how neural network work, neural networks, even artificial neural networks work, and that's what they can do best. And here's another example, and that's more, let's say, reinforcement learning. It's exploring an environment and while ex and building a model of an environment and while you explore it, but while you explore it, you get positive and negative rewards. Here you get the negative rewards. The baby wants to um, pass through an obstacle and, and the baby explores a room and learns by itself that it cannot pass through solid matter, for instance, okay? And uh, machine learning, in particular deep learning, which is a part of machine learning that is very successful, is also extremely successful in game playing. Now one would say, well, a game is something abstract, so how does that correspond with pattern recognition? But of course here, there are two important things. So there's tree search. Tree, a game uh, is a tree of possible moves and possible um, configurations of the game board, board configurations. So you have to navigate through this and to see what, what will these moves, what will my next moves, uh, to which configurations will they go? Are these good or bad configurations? And now comes the pattern recognition. I must recognize whether configuration very quickly, whether the configuration is possibly a winning or possibly with high probability a winning configuration or a losing configuration. Now we cannot do that mathematically. Yeah, that's too complicated. We cannot have all possible configurations. That's a, an enormous number that we could never store. But what we could do is and what machine learning can do, what babies cannot do, analyze millions of human games and plays millions of millions of, of, of thousands of millions, billions, let's say, yeah, of games against in computer against computer, computer against itself, and learn from this. Every of every of this see see millions of configuration and based on this configuration get a feeling of whether this is good or not. So it's again pattern recognition, even though it's a much more it looks much more formal than this. But it's not only pattern recognition. So there are also sophisticated research techniques, but there is not really big knowledge in it. The knowledge is this pattern, this recognizing whether machine, whether both, whether either a configuration is a winning configuration or whether a move is a good move based on, on a good configuration. Okay, what machine learning alone cannot do? Um, using transferable knowledge and reasoning. Okay, so here is a very interesting example. A Chinese businesswoman was accused of jaywalking after uh, an AI camera spots her face on an advert on a bus. So here you see um, there's a crossing and there's a bus, a pedestrian crossing, and there's a bus going the, the other way. Can you see that? I don't hope you can see it here. Yeah. A bus, and on this bus, there's an advert 
with here you see it in, in large with this uh, Chinese businesswoman. Okay, the camera spotted this and said, "Oh, you are jaywalking here. You're walking while the uh, in, in in the red face, red light face." Okay, so. Instead, that was just an advert on the, on the bus. Now, a human wouldn't make this error for several reasons. The human has knowledge about the world. So we would know, well, where the, there's only a half body here. Okay, so that cannot be. And then we would know, oh, this is a bus and the bus usually has some pictures on it. So that could be a picture. The picture is exactly moving with the bus, etc. Yeah, so this is a lot of knowledge, but this knowledge, machine learning can only to a certain extent learn knowledge uh, so this is knowledge that, that we acquired and that we can, uh, because, because we learned what a bus is, and, yeah, we know what people told us what a bus is, that uh, maybe we learned it in a different way. But this is knowledge that, that you cannot, could be, would, could be very useful actually, yeah, in addition to uh, pure machine learning. Yeah, if, if there was knowledge that could interact with this machine learning, and then probably you would, uh, the, the, um, a uh, computer wouldn't have done this error. Now here I give you some other examples where common sense could help machine learning. Now here you see a banana and the banana is filmed by a camera and the camera has a neural network that classifies objects. So this object is correctly classified as a banana and not as a slug, for instance, okay? And that's by a deep learning system by Google. Now, deep learning can be fooled due to lack of world knowledge and common sense. And actually, if you want to see this, I have a URL of, of a movie here that I will not show you, but if this, you can go to this movie, the talk will be uh, online, so you can then go to this URL and, 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 and see the movie, which is very interesting. So how can we fool, how can a person, or how can we fool this system? This is a sticker, and the sticker contains an image, a distorted image of a toaster with some vegetables, etc. Yeah, just to, to make it more interesting, probably, yeah, to put more colors in it, etc. And to attract the attention more. Yeah. And then you put this sticker, this is a paper sticker, you put this paper sticker next to the banana. And suddenly, machine learning learns, this is a toaster. Okay, so how it, nobody knows why the problem is that neural networks don't give you explanations. Yeah. But the trained neural network learned that this is a toaster and you cannot only do this with banana you can do it with many many different objects yeah so people badly minded people may even uh, on purpose um, uh, how to say uh, spoil machine learning here and that could also lead to to major incidents etc yeah so imagine about autom autonomously driving cars what what they what that could be yeah so that's a very interesting example but of course if, if, if there was some common sense, if there was some logical knowledge about uh, the, the world, uh, concrete knowledge, yeah, a toaster is usually larger than a banana. So with very low probability, this can be a toaster because this is a banana, yeah? So a toaster cannot be half a banana, okay? So if we, we immediately recognize that this cannot be a toaster, yeah? But this, this knowledge is not there. Of course, if you train the system very specifically, yeah, on the difference between toasters and the bananas, maybe it would, but still, yeah, it's, it's very, it's impossible to train the system on, on all possible combination of things, okay? So common sense knowledge would be very useful here. Another uh, aspect of, ne negative aspect of machine learning, it can lead to unfair um, conclusions. So in, for example, unfair credit rating. So Jamie Hanemeyer Hansen had a better credit score than her husband. Tech entrepreneur David, they have equal shares in their property and filed joint tax record. Yet David was given permission to, to borrow 20 times the amount of his Apple card than his wife was granted. Okay, so she actually should have, should have gotten more. So this was not the computed credit score, but that was the real life credit score here. Uh, she had everything that her husband had, yeah, everything was joined. Still, her husband gets a much better um, credit. So how can that be? Now, how can that be? Again, this is because the system is biased, gender biased. Now, Apple said gender is not input to the algorithm, okay? But this doesn't matter 
this will be implicitly uh, learned from other attributes. Gender will be implicitly assumed from other attributes. Okay, so what she buys, for instance, if she buys a lipstick, then of course the system knows, I don't know what, what this is, but for example, yeah, if she buys certain things, then the system concludes about gender, yeah, or sports clubs, your members in, etc. Everything that is on Facebook is probably analyzed by this algorithm. And so the algorithm, even though if, if, it, if the algorithm is forbidden to, the neural network is forbidden to take gender into account, yeah, implicitly it learns it. And uh, Rachel Thomas uh, from Data Ethics said, even if race and gender are not inputs to the algorithm, it can still bias on these factors. And that's a matter of fact, okay? So this is not good. And now I will tell you my personal story. Uh, regarding creditworthiness, okay? As uh, Mirna already said, I live in, I'm, I'm European, I live in three countries actually, I have domiciles in three countries. My main domicile is the UK for tax reasons, or I have to underline this, yeah? But um, I have credit cards in different countries. This is a credit card in, in the UK, and this wasn't, was one that unfortunately doesn't exist because it's a very good one, but uh, this one is an Italian credit card, for instance, and so on, mm -hmm. yeah? Now, uh, these are nine of my 12 credit cards. Now, if I look at my credit limit that I have on this credit card, so I, let me first say, I really wanted this credit card and I changed the name into Sand Bank for legal reasons because I don't want to be sued if that becomes, if this talk becomes uh, public. But, so I really wanted to have this credit card sent, which I call it now Sand Bank from Sand Bank, because it's a credit card that gives you very good uh, exchange rates and has very low fees, etc. So I applied for it and I was very happy to get it. But then when I looked close, closely at it, I was not happy because I only had a 500 pound credit rating. Whereas on all my other cards, I had around 10,000, I don't know, it is even 20,000, 12,000, 14,000 euro, etc. So I was very angry and I phoned Sandbank and I said, uh, why do I have only 500? What can you do with a credit card with 500 pounds? Nothing. I mean, if I go uh, with my family to Australia or wherever, uh, after two days or three days, my credit, uh, my credit runs out. So what can I do here? And they said, well, we don't know it. We, we did that through a credit rating agency. I say, okay, I insist that you give me now the name of this credit rating agency. And uh, then I found the agency and the agency said, well, we have used the best machine learning program. Okay. Okay. So I, I insist I want to know what happens. Yeah, but that's so difficult. We can't tell you. Yeah. And I said, yeah, take your time. Yeah. I call you back in two weeks. Maybe you can tell me something. In two, in two weeks, I called them back and they told me, well, you know, we still don't know exactly what happened, but it must have to, to, to do with the place where you live. So probably they experimented with the neural network and put some other input, maybe some other addresses input, and suddenly my credit rating went up. And immediately at this moment, I understood what was going on here. I had bought a new house with my, and where I moved in with my family. Before I moved in, before I bought the house, there was another owner, of course, and uh, there was a tenant of the other owner. And I immediately, so I, I met this tenant, he was a very nice guy. Um, but as soon as I moved in, I noticed that this guy was never paying, had never paid his debts because I got tons of, uh, of letters. And um, sometimes I opened the letter because I thought it was for me. And I said, oh, you owe us that much. People were even knocking at the door and saying, we owe us money, etc." Yeah. So I knew this guy was, uh, and, and later on, I, this guy was from Iceland. Later on, I learned that he was involved in a big finance scandal in Iceland when he turned, returned to Iceland. So anyway, so basically because this guy had lived there at, the, at this address, at the same address, yeah, uh, my, it, it, my, I, I got a bad credit worthiness because a machine learning program has, and I say reasonably learned, people who live in a joint household with somebody who does not pay their bills, are likely to fail repaying their own debts. So why do I say reasonably? It's certainly an ethically very questionable rule, yeah? But from a purely statistical point of view, it's reasonable, yeah? It's reasonable to assume this because in statistically it happens. Ethically, it's probably wrong because if I don't pay my debts, why should my sister be punished for it or my mother, okay? If, I, if we live in the same household. And, but in this case, it was even worse because it was applied to wrong data because I was not, this guy was no longer living there. 
So we have nothing to do with him. He was not the owner of the house. I'm a new owner. He was the tenant of the previous owner and probably he didn't pay his rent, okay? So I was really angry about this because, but this shows what kind of errors machine learning can do, yeah? Because machine learning is assuming to be applied to, to good data, to realistic data, but there is no, they, so they have a database of where people live and I was in the database with this house because I applied for a credit. Yeah, when I bought the house, I applied for an, a loan, a mortgage, and I got the mortgage from another, and probably another credit. So, so at this point, I got this mortgage. Yeah, so I was there. And so they have a, a central database where they know where people who, who had a mortgage or with certain loans, etc., live. And this guy was still there because nobody removed him from the database. Why should they remove him? In, in, in the UK, you don't have to go to any office and to say, I don't live there any longer. And so, so they don't, they, they may learn it eventually, okay? But they don't, they don't know it immediately. And so it's a kind of lazy database and the data, the database is inconsistent in a certain sense, but machine learning does know this. Common sense, of course, knows it because if you have a human credit rater, the human credit rater say, oh, this guy lives there, that other, he moved in, of course, they are, with his family, of course, the other with high percentage, this other guy has moved out. Okay, so this is complete. A human would not never do this error, and a human credit grader would certainly know that this is a lazy database. Okay, so a human credit grader, rating expert would instead use the rule: if property owners move into their recently bought one family property, then the previous occupiers have most likely here we have a probabilistic rule. Okay, most likely moved out and gives it a likelihood of, let's say, 95%, okay? This rule actually could be used to update the database before applying machine learning. And that's a very simple interaction between machine learning and rule-based knowledge. Rule-based knowledge could be applied over the data and then machine learning can be used. And then again, rule-based knowledge can look at the results, yeah? And this would make reasoning much better. So what is rule-based knowledge? Reasoning on top of the big data, what is it? So we have a database, for example, this property database that I said, but I will show you another one, a marriage database in my next slide. And then you have knowledge, which is represented in form of rules. And this knowledge basically infers new data. You see all these red dots here from the old data, from the database. Now this new data could be asserted, but it could also be only used on the fly because maybe you don't wanna store it because this is too much. Okay, so you could use it on the fly. And rules encapsulate transferable knowledge arising from various sources. And here are the most important sources, I think. Human experience, common sense, and expert knowledge. Okay, you can, you can formulate that in form of rules. Of course, you need a nice formalism for it. I will come to it. Definitions, norms, laws, and regulations. So this, these are some rules that don't come from single uh, people's experience, but these are norms that may be laws that are voted, yeah, that are common, a common effort that arose from a common effort of humanity. And of course, you, rules could also arise from machine learning. Machine learning could also bring rules. And we don't know exactly how to use such rules. Machine learning results, a machine learning program could also um, provide rules, okay, learn rules. We don't know, and that's basically my project, and I will speak about it a little bit later, how these rules are related to rules that come from experts or from lawmakers, etc. Now, I will give you a sim very simple example of how rules can make a database more intelligent, okay? So here you have a marri marriage database, but this database is not ordered, so you don't know, sometimes you have uh, the man first, and sometimes you hear Liz Taylor, you have the woman first. It just gives you couples, yeah? And why can that be? Normally a database is regulated. It could be because this database arose from an integration of various databases and you're not sure, yeah, who, you're no longer sure who, who is the wife and who is the husband, etc. yeah? Now, you, might, you may ask a query to the database, so, so this database says who is married to whom in which interval, okay? From 66 to 75, Schneider was married to Mayen. So now you may ask a query, when was Taylor married to Burton? So you know Taylor was married, I think, seven times or so, two, twice to Burton actually. And so here you see the answer. Taylor 
was married to Burton from 1964 to 74, and then from 75 again to 76. Okay, they tried again for a short period. Now, if you ask the qu query here, married Burton Taylor, X, Y, and that's the, what you want to know, these intervals, you would get nothing because Burton Taylor is not in the database. Of course, a human who inspects this database would clearly know that marriage is symmetric and you, you would use symmetry, the symmetry rule of marriage, yeah, in order to know uh, the answer. So now we could here add to the database the symmetry rule of marriage. We can say, if U is married with V during the period X, Y, X, Y, then V is also married with U during X, Y. So far, marriage is still symmetric, okay? There could be ex still examples where marriage is not symmetric. If you are married in, 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 in different countries and in one country you divorce and you are still married in the other country, one person is still married who lives in one country is married to the other while they are divorced. Both are divorced in the other country. But let's, in general, this rule is, is valid, okay? Marriage is symmetric. And if you add this rule to the database and then do logical reasoning with this rule, so that's a, yeah, then, then you, you can get the correct answer here. A correct answer. Now, this rule is a logical formula, and we generally often omit here the universal quantifiers. It should say for each u, v, x, y, this is true, okay? In addition to this database, which is factual knowledge. So that's how rules work. And this rule is a very simple data log rule. You call it, we call that data log. It works because it's a logic that works on big data. Now, rules can, of course, be much more complicated. And I will give you examples of more complicated rules, but I will not tell you exactly how we deal with this, but we have to deal, unfortunately, with this. Well, fortunately, I don't know. So we have classical and non-monotonic negation. So we say, for instance, if it doesn't rain, and if we know that it doesn't rain, and if it's Sunday, on Sundays when there's good weather, basically, when it does not rain, when you know it does not rain, so that's this not here, this, this, this symbol means not, then there will be a park concert on that date when it doesn't rain in Hyde Park, okay? But now I give you another type of negation, which is non-monotonic negation. If X is a person and if X is not known to be guilty, so that this not means not known to, is not known to be guilty, then X is presumed innocent, okay? It's not that you have to prove that X is guilty. Here you have to know that there's good weather, but here you don't have to know that X is guilty. You just have to not know that X is guilty, and then you have to presume it innocent. That's a general rules in, rule in most countries, most democracies at least, let's say, uh, in, for, for um, criminals. Then we have probabilistic rules, for instance. Uh, this rule, this is a probabilistic fact here uh, with, uh, a weather forecast with 0 0.8 probability, the weather in London on this date, there will be heavy snow, okay? And then you have another rule, and that's, that's now a probability for a rule. The weather in London, if, if on a certain date, so this, this is now a variable, that's why I have written it with uppercase here. If on a certain date in London, there is snow, um, and if a flight F at a certain date uh, from goes f at the same date goes from London at the same date you see goes from London then with probability 0 0.3 this date will this this flight will be delayed okay there will be a delay in the flight because there's heavy snow yeah so these are common sense rules of course you have to these probabilities can for instance come from machine learning you learn from statistical analysis but also from machine learning yeah so you don't have to just guess the probabilities, you can learn them, yeah? or, or you can just do a statistical analysis. Then another type of rules is disjunction. A staff member is either a consultant or an employee. And then another very important rule is type of rules is existential rules. If in a room uh, there's a machine of type T64640 uh, in a room, then there must exist a high current plug in the room. Then there exists a plug P. So there exists something P such that plug P is in this room and it's a high current plug, for instance, okay? So that's for a more technical rule, let's say. Also come knowledge, this is technical knowledge that we express through a rule. Now I will show you an even worse thing, an even more complicated thing. This is a rule that has aggregates, recursion, and arithmetic in it. 
uh, we want to know when a company, a company X controls a company Y, and we say company X controls company Y, if either X equals to Y because each company controls itself, or X controls a set of companies, here we are in set theory, Mirna, <laughs> X are finite, yeah. X controls a set of companies that jointly hold over 50% of Y, okay? So that's the definition of controlling. This definition has to be an agreement. If this is an agreement among many people who define what does it mean control, yeah? Actually, it's a little bit more complex, complex than that, yeah? Because you have voting shares and non-voting, I have left it, already it is. But you can translate this rule into a recurse, this, sorry, this human made, this human sentence in English, human made sentence, law or whatever definition, yeah? This human made definition into a logical definition with rules. You can say every company controls itself, okay? So for, that means, that means from true, it follows that every company controls itself. And if X controls Y and uh, company Y owns a proportion W of Z, and if we take the sum of all such Z's, so all such W's for all such Z's, so this is a kind of aggregate function. Don't worry about the syntax here. Yeah. So if the sum of all, yeah, companies Y that I, the, of all companies that some, uh, if X controls Y, and the sum of all this is greater than zero point five, then X controls C. Okay. So that's recursive because controls is defined here in terms of controls of, of owns, but. Uh, in terms of controls also, because we use this control in the antecedent here, okay? It's a recursive definition. So we, so what, what do I want to show you with this? I want to show you it's difficult. So here, you see here you have a network of companies and you want to know whether this company controls this one. It's not so easy, yeah? But with these rules, you can do it. And these rules are in a language that you can also execute. It's, it's, it's at the same time, a, it's an extension of the data log language that I just mentioned. It's a programming language actually, in which you can directly uh, translate this, this rule, yeah? What do I want to show you? I want to show you with this slide that uh, finding a language that for reasoning is not so easy because we have to take care of all these aspects and that makes the language not only syntactically complex, it makes it also complex and actually undecidable to execute, yeah? So it, it's, it's very difficult and time consuming. Whereas, when we go back to the neural networks very quickly, when we go back to the neural networks, then I said back propagation made neural networks very fast. It's an analytical method that uses differentiation that makes networks very fast. So that's one of the very big problems of symbolic AI, the extremely high complexity that it has. Yeah, that, and, and so, it, it's very difficult to deal with this. So there's an enormous amount of research uh, on reasoning and computational complexity and on rule-based knowledge representation and reasoning. And really, really in practice, uh, rule-based rule reasoning is really problematic due to its high complexity. It's either undecidable, undecidable may, means there's no algorithm at all that can do it, or it's very complex it requires exponential or double exponential time, yeah? And we cannot afford it, yeah, if we have a lot of data on big data, okay? So it's not suited for big data. And therefore my own research goal over so many, many years uh, is to find lightweight reasoning formalisms that work for big data and suit sweet, uh, real problems uh, and having a low complexity, but maintaining the highest possible expressive power. And here you have just, Example. So even if you just add existential, the existential quantification to, to, to simple rules, to data log rules, yeah? Simple data log rules with existential quantification, we are already undecidable. And if we, and then we study various formalisms, let me, let me show you where we want to come up. So these are extremely simple rules. And actually these rules here are rules that express ontological reasoning. And here on the, on the left-hand side, you have some specific logic yeah, that says every professor has to teach to at least one student, okay? And here you can express it in, in our formalism and in, data log, in an extension of data log with existential quantification. For each X, if X is a professor, then there must exist a student, then there must exist a Y such that X teaches to Y. Okay, then we can also say that in such case, Y must be a student, okay? For each professor, if 
so in the script, the professors and students, a professor is not a student. This rule may, of course, be, let's assume that professors, for, at least for the same course, cannot be students of the same course. Professor X and student X implies false, okay? So we must have this false, false sign in rules, yeah? Uh, then we can have symmetry, as we already know from the marriage problem. If X, for each X, Y, if X has, a, has Y as tutor, then Y teaches to X, okay? So that's a kind of symmetry rule, but it's a different symmetry rule. It's a symmetry for two different, it, that means that this predicate here teaches to is a symmetric predicate to has tutor. And then we can also say we have functionality constraints. Has tutor X, Y, and has tutor X, Z, then Y is equal to Z, okay? I cannot have two tutors, okay? So this, so we are studying this type of rules and I will be very quick now, just to give you an impre impression and to impress you also. Yeah? Uh, we study various classes of formalisms and their complexity and other people too, so we are not the only ones who study. And wh what is our goal? Our goal is to find good formalisms like this one, Core Vadalog, is a language that we designed that allows you to express many, many, many things that you want to express in real life and that you want to use for reasoning in real life. And that is a superset of data log, for instance, with existential quantifier, with probabilistic reasoning and other stuff, okay? And which is still polynomial. So here you have, it's not undecided, but it's in polynomial and possibly even, even better than polynomial. And this is for only for people who know complexity. It, in, in, in a complexity class called n log non-deterministic log space. Okay, that's that's how this uh, these rules that we uh, so we, this vada log language that we defined looks like. It's based on the concept of warded rules. I will not explain it in detail, but just to give you a glimpse, and then I will come back to, to more general uh, statements. Okay, so I will give only a glimpse now for the technically interested here. Uh, so. Rules of this form are in general undecidable already because there's existential quantification, as I said. But now we, we limit the syntax of the bodies, of the rule bodies. And how do we limit it? We show where the scope, where, so existential quantification can be expressed through scolem fun functions and scolem functions can propagate. So if, if I unify rules, these scolem functions can propagate, okay? And they come into several, they could come into several positions and we call these positions affected. And now when is a, when is a position in a rule body dangerous? If it is affected in the rule head, if it occurs in the rule head, if the same variable on this position occurs in the rule head, so this X occurs in the rule head, it is affected and it also occurs in the rule body, okay? And it doesn't occur in any non-affected position. Yeah, then it is dangerous. And what we are doing is basically, we identified, it's very easy to identify these dangerous variables here, there are positions here, sorry. Yeah, these are all the red positions that are dangerous, okay? And what we are doing is, we are basically enforcing that dangerous positions are all in a single atom that we call ward. It's different from guard, by the way, yeah, ward. And this ward is only connected by non-affected positions to the rest. So why, but this, this Y is affected. That's true, it's affected here, but it's not affected here and it must unify and so it becomes not affected actually, okay? So that's just for explanation, yeah? So the interaction here is soft between the ward and the rest of the rule, yeah? So that sounds difficult and it is also not completely trivial, but it's, it's, it's easy actually if you look at a little bit, an easy definition of what warded means. And the good thing about warded is, warded is really a nice logic because it's polynomial, you can evaluate it in polynomial time. And the huge fragment of worded logic is also even, can even be evaluated with very, very efficient algorithm, okay? Now, let me come back to the interface between machine learning and logical reasoning. As we said, there has been tremendous recent, recent progress in machine learning, in particular deep, reason, deep learning, reinforcement learning, as I mentioned, new data analysis, analysis techniques. And logical reasoning, we have to admit it, have lagged behind. The reason is it's simply more complicated. It's not, yeah, it's not that it, logical reasoning is stupid, yeah, more stupid or ugly or whatever. It's simply more complicated. I mean, some programs, some problems need more time, yeah, and we need a different approach. And we are trying now this, this approach to identify really good fragments of logical reasoning, okay? Still, many researchers, even in the machine learning community, believe 
combining machine learning with transferable knowledge and logical reasoning is essential for achieving next level AI. And that's the future of AI. And that's also what I think I'm not, uh, is the future of AI. I'm not alone here. There's a recent book by Gary Marcus uh, saying, we urgently need to get cracking on building machines equipped with common sense, cognitive models, and powerful tools for reasoning. Together with machine learning, these can lead to deep understanding, itself a prerequisite for building machines that can reliably anticipate and evaluate the consequences of their actions. The royal road to better AI is through AI that genuinely, genuinely understands the world. And I think logic is the solution to it. Okay, sorry. That was an overhead slide that was dangled, dangling around. So now let me make an, an analogy between this machine learning, the separation machine learning on one hand and reasoning on the other hand. I think there's a big, great analogy between what is called the brain lateralization thesis. Yeah? Brain lateralization thesis is an unproven thesis, uh, which is just a thesis that the left hemisphere specializes in verbal and language skills and the right hemisphere specializes in visual and spatial activities. It is a much debated thesis, but most neuroscientists, and I went to Vienna to the science ball, and everybody who goes, and Mirna, if you love Vienna, please come to the science ball in Vienna, because that's really beautiful. It's a ball for all scientists. It's less formal than a normal ball. Yeah? You don't have to wear a black tie. You can't, yeah? And it's, you have to invite me. Yeah, I will invite you. <laughs> so it's a great ball. But one thing that is really great is, if you have a question about uh, neuroscientist science, for instance, yeah? At that ball, you will find a huge group of neuroscientists all sitting on, on similar, on, close to each other, yeah, and, or dancing with each other. And you can just address, address all of them together. Yeah, you can broadcast to them a question and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's some truth in the lateralization thesis, okay? And so that's exactly what I did. I went, at this ball, I went to neuroscientists and asked them, so what happens with the lateralization thesis? Well, they say, what they say is, it's true, there is some truth about it. There is, we, we can observe it, but there's a lot of thing going on between the two hemispheres that we don't know. So there are a lot of connections. And for me, this is just an example. It's just, uh, uh, just to make, to understand, I think the, 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 the difference between machine learning and rural knowledge is similar to this supposed difference between uh, the right, right brain and the left brain. Still, I don't want to make any, uh, com I, I don't want to say anything about BLT. I want to say, speak about artificial intelligence, but it's, I think the coincidence is just too nice. Yeah. And it has also remar been remarked by others, but independently by me, by myself. So sub-symbolic and self-learned is on, in the right part of the brain. It corresponds more or less to the right part of the brain. And we know that babies, for instance, when they recognize things, they activate more the right part of the brain Yeah, when they recognize their mother. And rules and knowledge, and here we have a rule yeah, X and Y implies Z, yeah, goes to this, on the left part of the brain. And my hypothesis, and that's of course very bold, I have to say, yeah, uh, is that the facts are mostly recognized. Yeah, fact, factual knowledge is very, a lot of factual knowledge is recognized here by the right part of the brain. And then we get a rule that we get from somebody, from our parents or our grandmother or, or that we read. And then we apply and we fill in these variables. We instantiate these variables with facts from the right part of the brain and we conclude something, okay? Certainly, I have no proof that this is, this is just my model of how it works, okay? And how we could, and what could be the bridging between these two parts, okay? And certainly this will not be, in neurophysiology, will be much more complicated. But for AI, this would already be a big step if we could do this, okay? And now let me give you an example again. So, uh, woman goes, or a girl goes to the wood, lives nearby a forest, goes to the wood and sees this mushroom here, you know, the red mushroom with the white dots. In English, I learned it's called a fly agric, okay, a fly agric, it may have other names too. And immediately, yeah, she recognizes this, okay? And then, of course, she will always remind what her grandmother told her, namely, fly agrics are poisonous mushrooms. If you eat a poisonous mushroom, you may die. Okay, so at least at the beginning, the first time, the second and third time, yeah, this girl sees fly agrics when she wanders around a uh, forest. She makes this conclusion, oh, this is poisonous. And I, will, I know knowledge, common sense knowledge, poisonous may make me sick or may even die. 
okay? So this is type of reasoning. Now, if I do this reasoning very often, it may pass to the right part of the brain, okay? And then I immediately abstain from this mushroom and I don't even think about dying, okay? But forget about this. At least there must be some reasoning initially, yeah? And because my grandmother tells me, uh, that her grandmother tells her this rule and she instantiates this rule with poisonous mushroom, okay? Now, that means induction, self-learning and intuition is more something of, of right uh, cerebral and deduction, transferable and verbal knowledge is more on the left part of the brain. Neural networks, now in, in computer science, neural networks, statistical learning and data mining correspond more to the right part and expert system, knowledge-based system more to the left part. Computationally very fast, the right part is very fast, yeah? And the left part is unfortunately, these reasoning tasks are very, very slow. And interestingly, uh, and I think I'm the first to notice this, uh, sorry, this corresponds in a very, very tightly to uh, Daniel Kahneman's fast thinking and, and, and slow thinking, okay? I mean, of course, th that machine learning corresponds to fast thinking and reasoning to slow thinking. If, if you know Daniel Kahneman's book about fast and small, slow thinking, I will not now explain it, yeah? So I think we have this dichotomy here, uh, or this duality here, more better duality than dichotomy that we can bridge in a certain sense. And that's actually the key idea uh, that we should do bridging it. How can we bridge it? So on one hand, we have machine learned knowledge and on the other hand, we have expert knowledge. Now, expert knowledge can be, as, we, as I have shown you, translated into facts and rules, but we could also translate machine learning into facts and rules. A neural network, uh, first of all, machine learning is not only neural networks, it is also data mining and data mining will give you rules actually. Yeah, it will provide rules. Secondly, even neural networks, there are lots of people, yeah, f over 5,000 papers now that try to translate and some very successfully already neural networks into um, decision trees, which are already rule based kind of rules, sets of rules can be translated in, their, in turn into rules. So this is called an area of AI, which is called explainable AI because neural, neural networks are very opaque. We don't know why. And so people now, a lot of researchers jumped on this very interesting research question. How can we make a neural network? Can we explain why a neural network decides that this is a car and th that this is a, how to say, a person that, or this is a traffic sign or whatever, yeah? Now, Georg, can, can you just watch the time a bit? Yeah, yes. Because we are like uh, a little bit over. Uh, sorry. We? Facts, so we, I, I will. So we, we translate this into facts and rules and many people study this already, but very few people study what I want to study in my project, the interaction mechanism between rules and facts that are machine learned and rules and facts that are from coming from expert knowledge. Yeah, so what kind of, of thing, what, what kind of interaction is there? For example, a further vision of mine in, in this project is to, to, to de develop a kind of logical control theory of, of machine learning. So you probably all know what control theory is. You have a process and the process, uh, you, you have to keep a process into its, its legal borders basically. Yeah? Um, and, and so, Normally you do this by measuring and if it goes over, if, 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 if a heater goes, if, if the room becomes too hot, then you stop the heater and then if it comes too cold, then you switch it on again and switch it off and on and off and on to keep the room at a certain temperature. Here, we, what I want to do is a kind of logical control theory. You have learned facts and rules. Uh, they are the output of a learning process. And then you do a logical consistency check. You check the consistency with rules that are coming from legal constraint, regulations, expert knowledge, physical laws. Um, for instance, that you should not use, you should not bias on gender yeah, or on race. Yeah? And this can be expressed in a certain sense into rules and the rules can understand whether this has happened here or not. And then it can block this machine learning, yeah, it can block the output. But this, this is a fantasy for the moment. We don't know how to work, how to do it, but this is part of my project. So I'm already almost at the end of my talk. So what my project shall deli should deliver is through theoretical research and advanced software engineering, we strive for a, ru a new rule language, yeah, be even better than Vadalog because we need also to incorporate basically machine learning rule into it and more statistics and probabilities a theoretical foundation of rule interaction, expert rules, 
how do they interact with machine learned rules, new reasoning methods and algorithms, hopefully efficient algorithms, and at the end, a software toolbox for hybrid problem solving where logic interacts with machine learning. And this should enable many users in disparate areas to build successful applications. And the question, of course, is, is such a thing feasible? Can, can you do such a thing? Is it feasible? And from a previous project, we know that it is feasible. Uh, this previous project was a project where we were dealing with an ERC grant, dealing with um, web data extraction. And we wanted, to, we, we designed a system that is able to extract data in a certain application area, like real estate or used cars or hotels or shops, etc. cetera. Um, extracting data, you give the system only URLs and the system can extract data. And we have designed this, a system that uses both a lot of knowledge, okay? And at the same time, machine learning for recognizing small entities on, on the web pages in this domain. And I want to conclude my talk by giving you a very short demo, how the system works, what it can do automatically. It works very well. We created afterwards a company, as you said, Rapidity. The company was sold to Meltwater, and Meltwater is a, is a very big news intelligent company that uses this, this software on a, with, with millions of web pages now, um, websites now, hundred thousands of websites and millions of web pages. And here is how the system works. So what you see here is a list of thousands of URLs on real estate, different real, real tours or real estate agents, as you say, in the UK. Um, a very, very big list. So the system goes to the first page and analyzes it. And it has already found that this is a sales, it classifies the, the field. So it classifies this as a buy rent field. The field says sales, okay? You need some knowledge to do that. Yeah, you need the knowledge. First of all, you need knowledge to see what I'm, am I looking for here, yeah? A field, input field, because I need to input something in order to get data at the end. I want, I'm interested in getting all the prop, extracting all the real estate properties from this, from this realtor, okay? Then it classifies this as a price field, etc. So it continues, I'm really almost finished. It also does it with, and now it, it understands the fields it want to input, it inputs, it, it tries to input without any restriction and it gets to special pages. It also can handle, the system can also handle next page links, all types of like next page links. Okay, also due to knowledge because we have given the system the knowledge yeah, of how to handle, how to recognize and how to handle that. It can segment pages, it can understand what is a single description of a property and then it can filter the attributes of a property automatically. Okay, so it filters the relevant property that they want to have in a database automatically. And it extracts this. And then it goes to the next page and it tries and then it goes from sales to lettings. And so now it does a second query, it goes to lettings, it puts, it inputs lettings, okay? Now it extracts all the letting records and it, it, it analyzes these records. And now the system has, sorry, the system has produced a program for this website. This is a program in a language that we have uh, designed, which is called OxPath, as opposed to XPath, which existed, which is a language for extracting data. And this exactly goes to the relevant pages and extracts the relevant items with the relevant attributes or, or the relevant attributes and produces records. Okay. And if you look at these records in a database view, that's how they, oh, sorry. We have seen the records, million, thousands of records of, of, of properties of available properties. Okay. I think I'm, I'm at the end now. I don't, I don't show you the used cars because of time and maybe you have some questions. Thank you very much for inviting me Mirna and thank you very much for listening and for your patience with this talk. Thank okay. you very much Georg. I'm sure you could uh, show us many other things. This was very interesting and I think for those of us uh, here in the audience, perhaps who didn't know how to uh, how the inside of the computer works. Now, now yeah. they have seen the connection, and I think that this is a brilliant idea to uh, try to connect uh, logical expression with uh, different ways of learning. It's it's very original. Uh, do anybody in the audience have one question? Maybe because we already 15 minutes into meal drugs time. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, well, real drug is so kind that he said that it was fine with him. So, uh, one question, therefore. Uh, I'll ask a question. Then, just there, the, this, um, this uh, new language that you have developed, which uh, 
brings the complexity of the etalog into uh, into the polynomial time and even less. It looks a little bit, the idea looks like the idea of looking at the monadic logic rather yes. than the secondary logic. Okay, yes. so it is. It's, but it's not, we, the, the, I mean, in this formalism, we can do joints. So it's not, it's not mon, I mean, we, it's not the monadic logic here. Um, we have another logic that is monadic, but this one is not monadic. Yeah, but it's, it's what well, you are completely right. I mean, monadic logic would be one solution. Yeah, yeah. and the other solution would be guarded. But guarded yeah. is too weak for us because guarded would not be um, a superset of data log. We want to have all data log in it because in guarded you can have joints and, and so you, and you, have out, to you cannot them. guard them. Yeah, so, so we, we really took us a long time to find this logic, which is a super logic of data, data log is already polynomial, but we want to have data log with existential quantifiers polynomial. Yes, yes. Right? That's generally undecidable. And not, on, yeah, not only polynomial. That's what I meant to say. I shouldn't yeah. have said data yeah. log, no, no, but no, 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 there's, no there's some data log. No problem. Yes, thank you. Well, that's very interesting. Sorry that we have to stop. No, no, I, uh, may, I say, may I say only one thing? I yes. have I, I have a student position on this project, yeah? Um, so if you, if you go to the website of our department, Computer Science Oxford University, and there is scholarships, there is one scholarship for a PhD, for a DPhil student in Oxford, for a doctoral student. Unfortunately, I must say really unfortunately, it's limited to European fees and to European students. So it can fully fund a student from either the European Union or the, the EE, European Economic, what is it? Um, oh. e, 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 See, yeah, area. associated countries. Yeah, it's very. This is very unfortunate, I, I, but that's how it is. But that's how it is. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. If, thank if you. you we'll tell the young to, people yeah. we know. That's very good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Big up, uh, for you. And then let us uh, go to Miodrag. Of course, Miodrag. We are going to give you your time that you deserve, and you are going to bring us to a different. Uh, part of human thinking, you are going to bring us to uh, social sciences. Uh, do we see you, Mildrag? Uh, yes, here he is. So let me introduce Mildrag Ivanovic. He is a professor at the University of Belgrade. He will speak on post-coronavirus trading liberty for security. And he is somebody who is 